I lied. I do have an opinion. <laughs> and I'm going to express it just briefly here before we go to our panel. And I want to explain that in addition to our two keynote experts, we also have with us tonight uh, Mr. Dylan Jones, who has written extensively about the Common Core Standards, is a critic of the Common Core, is that fair? Is a critic of the Common Core Standards. We also have with us Dr. Cindy Ellsbury, who is the superintendent of Horry County Schools, so I'm sure has some definite opinions, and Ms. Patty Hamill from Georgetown County. So we have an expert panel, and I want you to take advantage of this panel and ask the type of questions that you think are probing. And to frame, okay, here's my opinion, to frame the discussion. I heard myself just a little bit ago when I was uh, presenting the introduction, and I said the Common Core State Standards are not a curriculum. It's a guiding framework. Now, as I, was, as I was listening to the presenters, I remember sitting in the audience where you are back in the 80s in Ohio when they rolled out the outcomes-based proficiencies. The same thing was said by that speaker. But you know what happened? It wasn't a curriculum. But they started tying the assessments to the standards. As a teacher then, it became a curriculum for me. My point is, assessment, and we've heard a discussion about assessment over and over again tonight, the assessments that are related to the Common Core Standards are going to be key. That will determine what is taught and what is learned. So as we frame questions for our panel, keep in mind what we really want to do here, whether they're called standards, performance indicators, proficiencies, what we really want to identify is what constitutes relevant and meaningful learning for our students. Is there a way to interpret and translate these standards so that what students are learning is indeed relevant and meaningful? Having said that as a framework, I'd like to invite our panel to come to the stage. And if we have the ladies of Spadoni come forward for the microphones. And as I said earlier, if you have a question, please come to the aisle. They will hold the mic and they will allow you to address a specific question to any panel member, to all the panel members. And again, the focus here tonight is on the Common Core State Standards, so please keep it within the topic. If you have a question, please raise your hand, and depending on what side the question is, the microphone will be brought to you. Anyone can address this. All standards used in the various states have historically been field tested prior to implementation. The exception being the Common Core State Standards. Why have the states allowed this to occur since there is absolutely no evidence of practice and assessment to show that these standards are superior to any that have been used previously? I'd be, I'd be happy to, to jump in on that. You know, there, there are a couple things. One, the, the, the standards have been evaluated by organizations like the Fordham Foundation and, and, and others. Uh, so they have had, have had an external review, which is, as commissioner, that was one of the groups. There were several, but that was one of the groups that I usually look, look for when we modified the Florida standards uh, before Common Core. We'd always check off to see what Fordham thought of it, and if we thought we needed to, if, if they came back with a bad report, we'd, we'd work on it to strengthen them a bit. So Fordham Foundation for us was very important in the foundation, in the, in the, in the standards. What, uh, what is the, the field testing that you're referring to, often is, what it's associated with is the assessment process, and there's their field testing with, with the assessments uh, right now, as a matter of fact, uh, in states across the country for smarter balance, and for uh, for park, and uh, and and pardon, even this month. Yeah, like like probably this morning. <laughs> and I don't I don't know I haven't heard again I'm a little bit removed from it. But I don't know when they're they're going to be having some results, but uh, but I, I have heard reports that they're they're going fairly well. I had concerns early on about the technology, whether the technology is going to hold up because I personally had problems with that. 
but uh, uh, apparently both both consortiums have uh, moved on with some the field testing. Uh, once the field testing is done, they'll work on the cut scores and and then move from move from there forward. Uh, so just quick follow up. Um, field tests have not been uh, completed yet. Uh, they will be prior to the on this. All other standards historically have been put into place after the field test, then adopted. The Common Core has been adopted, but the field test and the assessments have confirmed their adoption. This is the only time in American history that this has occurred. Mm -hmm. Mr. Uh, Jones. Y'all hear me? All right. Well, all of y'all that stayed here for extra credit, here's the part where someone disagrees, so hopefully it's a little more exciting. Um, <laughs> the answer is money. Um, states were offered a lot of money to adopt these Common Core standards. Um, first, uh, most obvious would be race to the top funds. This was, these were grants proposed um, during the stimulus package during the uh, Obama administration, which in order to apply, states had to um, sign on to um, a a common, common standards uh, aligned with states that were college and career ready. And common core standards were the only ones available at that time, so states then um, signed on to that. In addition, no child left behind waivers. Um, states have the option to get some waivers from no child left behind that everybody, of course, loves. Not really, but um, so in order to get on to get those waivers, you had to pretty much, pretty much the same wording sign on to a common uh, core of assessments throughout the states. Um, the other federal wing would be the tests. Um, as uh, Dr. Smith mentioned earlier, there are two consortiums, the Smarter Balanced and the Park, that were given uh, in total about $360 million from the federal government. So then the states could then sign on to one of those um, test, uh, tests, and that would be uh, the assessments for Common Core. South Carolina signed on to Smarter Balance. Um, there was some discussion on whether or not we're going to keep it. The, uh, the State Board of Education just decided today that they were going to keep on with the Smarter Balance test. Um, so, uh, money. I would just say that yeah, money certainly is, 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 always, is always an issue, is always a factor. Uh, I would say that, that um, for example, and I know this is topic is not race for talk. That'd be another race, race to the top. That might be another another conversation, That's, another yeah, day. A different conversation. But uh, <laughs> but I, I would say that you know, as we analyzed whether or not we wanted to apply for race to the top in 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 Florida, uh, you know, we knew f fully well that whatever if we won a, an award, that that couldn't supplant current funding. It it couldn't fill operational funding for the state or the department, and that it would be development costs for more work. And, and you know, my, my big thing with, with my staff was, was calculating what is the implementation of cost of anything that, that gets evolved out of Race at the Top, and how, how is that going to get sustained? So we were very, we weren't so attracted to any money in that process. We, we were, as a matter of fact, we weren't attracted at all to it. What we were really focused on was, are, are these the kind of things that we were, we, we were going to do anyway? And uh, could we could we could, could we move the move the ball with this this approach? So because we knew the money's going to disappear, so it wouldn't be anything that would help us long term. Thank you. I need a quick clarification, possibly from one of the superintendents. Smarter balance assessment is that still um, officially? It's still the assessment that South Carolina has adopted. Smarter balance. Yes. However, they stopped our field testing or allowed us to stop field testing this week uh, because there has not been a definite decision made. Uh, but to the question of field testing, we have certainly had our schools participate in that because as we've moved forward, certainly not only knowing the goal that was in mind, a means to be able to have our students perform certainly had nothing to do with factual information but process information and so I think that's critical to note that as we've looked at how our teaching strategies have changed 
It, our standards didn't change very dramatically at all in South Carolina. We had strong standards to begin with in ELA and math. They have transcended over to our social studies and science, and certainly the nonfiction item of being able to understand information in those content areas has been very important. So I, I want us to note that the standards for South Carolina were strong before. We certainly have taken great looks at those, and teachers have been involved as we've moved forward. Thank you. I would just say, um, I mean, I agree that the, uh, the standards were similar before, and they, if they were already good before, then why else would we change if it weren't for the money? I mean, if we had great standards before, then why, why else would we be signing on? I believe Warren, Dr. Smith has a uh, comment. Yes. Um, we, um, well, first of all, in South Carolina, we have a somewhat unusual higher education governance structure, uh, and that is we have a state board of education. The state board of education is um, elected by the legislature by judicial circuit. Um, Judicial circuits in South Carolina are not of the same size. Um, complicating that is the member of the State Board of Education rotates within the counties of the judicial circuit. So that's how the legislature judges who goes on the State Board of Education, what judicial circuit they live in, and what county within the circuit. Then we have the Education Oversight Committee, which was created to uh, monitor progress they issued a report this week, as a matter of fact, on the progress that we're making toward our 2020 goals. That group is appointed by the Speaker of the House, the President Pro Tem of the Senate, and the Governor. Each gets three appointments. Each of the three uh, appoint appointers has to appoint someone from education, someone from business, and what's the other? Education, business. So, so we have this Byzantine structure, and. Even this week, we had the Education Oversight Committee say that they, uh, they wanted to get away from uh, Smarter Balance, and we had the State Board of Education say that they were moving right ahead with Smarter Balance. So, uh, and it's an issue that every time I get a chance to, to talk to one or two people, uh, I talk about the issue of governance in the state of South Carolina because it's very confusing, and authority is very diffuse, and sometimes we have two boards of education that are actually speaking against each other and taking opposite positions, and we really had that happen this week. This is regarding the argument for Common Core, as mentioned, where transiency and gaps were uh, emphasized. Um, I was a transient growing up, moved everywhere, and um, to me, the issue of transient, transiency and gaps mean nothing. Um, it's not a good reason for Common Core, in my opinion, um, in that it's a smokescreen, uh, because it's not really about learning. Um, and in my opinion, um, I have children. Uh, I would rather them have gaps in their education and absolutely love learning than to have no gaps in their education and hate learning. So um, to me, Learning isn't about answering questions right, AKA testing. Um, it is about learning how to ask the right questions. Um, what about Common Core allows for that? If it's not simply, you know, it's gonna dovetail into just extreme testing as the No Child Left Behind Act has gone into. I'd like to respond to that question. Uh, I don't think you directed it at any single person. Um, I'll go back to the, the something that's been stated several times, that Common Core standards or any standards are just a list of knowledge and skills that we want our children to, to learn. Um, as Ms. Hamill has said, the, the standards, Common Core standards, are not significantly different from the old standards because they are this this common set of knowledge and skills that we think are important for children in our country, in our state, in our county to, to have and take them to college and career readiness. The difference that has resulted in a lot of concern is the way that those standards are assessed. And we have 
uh, as you heard earlier in Horry County Schools, we have trained our teachers on assessing students differently. I don't have my, a cartoon with me like Dr. Smith did, but I'll, I'll try to describe one that I've seen that shows a young man who's sitting in front of a, uh, across the desk from someone who's apparently interviewing him for a job. And uh, the gentleman must have asked the, the young man, what, what are you good at? And the, that wasn't constructed well, but I think that's how the, what the, how the cartoon read. But the young man says, well, I'm really good at, at bubbling in answers to test questions. Um, and, and we laugh at that, but yet that's what we've asked our students to do for many, many years in education. And I think our teachers are just, and I can't speak for every teacher, but what I've heard from so many of ours is that they are relieved that now students are going to be asked if, whether we use Smarter Balanced or, or Park or any other, ACT. Uh, ACT is one that's being considered by, by EOC. Whatever assessment it is, we desire that it be very different for our children, that they have to think, that they have to analyze and use those skills that are at the, at the top of Bloom's taxonomy so that they are really thinking and creating and doing those things that have made this country great. We aren't going to be great if all our students do is bubble in an answer. So uh, it's almost as if the standards... <laughs> The standards are quality standards. They are knowledge and skills. I think the issues that people have is the curriculum. And just so you know, we pick our curriculum. In Horry County and in Georgetown, we pick that curriculum. No one dictates that to us. We decide what we're going to teach. And we decide how we're going to teach it. So that's not being imposed by anyone, not the state and not the federal government. So we've, we've got the curriculum piece handled, so it's the assessment piece that is, is giving some people problems, but we have embraced it because we think it's best for children. Dylan? I'd have to agree with the, uh, when you asked the question that, I mean, Common Core is kind of a one size fits all, so all the, all the states that sign on to this have the same standards. But as we all know, South Carolina itself is very different from Texas, is very different from California, is very different from New York. So there's a lot of differences there. So just because education definitely is important doesn't mean they need to have the exact same standards. Um, I guess furthermore, as far as the curriculum is concerned, you're right, these are standards, but your curriculum is gonna be based off of, off of the standards and so well the assessments. So, I mean, what your standards are, are going to affect what's taught and how it can be taught. You know, if you're an, uh, you're an offensive line coach and you're, you're a running team and you're teaching your offensive linemen to, you need to run blocks. So you're coaching all, all your offensive linemen to run block. And now you get a new coach and they're like, oh, we're a passing team now. We're, so we're going to have to teach you how to pass block. There's some, I mean, I'm not a football player, but I know there's a lot of different techniques involved from when you run blocking and when you're pass blocking. So it, it definitely is going to have an impact on what is taught and what can't be taught. I'd like to add on to what Mr. Jones said. The beauty of standards is that we are allowed to add standards. So if there's something that's really important to us and to our community for our students to learn and to be assessed upon, we can add the, those standards. And you're exactly right. We, we want to do that. We want to personalize what we're teaching our children, but we also want that consistency so that we are, we, in Horry County, we compare ourselves to other states we and uh, that's important to us i think one of the comments that were made early on is very important as one of our speakers said when he started teaching he spent a lot of time on one thing and a colleague another and i will tell you in districts it was different from school to school from classroom to classroom and in georgetown we've made a real concerted effort for all of our teachers to work together to actually put curriculum together and then plan together on a basis all the time continually so that we didn't have private practice anymore. And so we had states with private practice too and when you went from state to state or when you were compared state to state, it's important that we know what our students learn in all classrooms. 
but it's important that teachers open their classrooms and work together. That's one of the most powerful pieces, I think, of standard spirit. Amy, could you pass the microphone to the gentleman with the beard? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Jajala. Um, so I have a few questions. I'll try to keep them short. I can't give a speech, can I? You know, that's what you're known for. I would be disappointed if you didn't. So first, I just, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a few statements, and I want you to see maybe if you've ever said this statement, if your son or daughter has ever made this statement, or maybe your students have made this statement. I've never been good at math. Math hates me. Everybody in my family has the math gene except me. Okay. Uh, how many people have at least heard somebody say that? Come on. Okay. So that's one issue. The other issue is there, there, there's a huge gap from high school to college. And I haven't been able to figure it out. But many people know that you take college algebra. College algebra really is ninth and 10th grade algebra. Coastal is not the only institution that offers it. University of Georgia offers it. University of Houston offers it. Stony Brook offers it. All institutions almost have college algebra. The percentage of students, just pick a number in your head, that do not pass with a C or better a high school math course their first year in college. Don't say it out loud. Just pick a percentage in your head. It's around 50%. And that's not just coastal. That's University of Houston, University of Georgia, University of South Carolina, students are not coming in prepared. And it's not their work ethic. Right now, the way math is taught, they don't think. And so one thing I've been seeing a lot of on Facebook is this, uh, there's this, this little thing where it says 17 plus, I don't know, 42. And it shows the way I did it, the way both Dr. Smiths probably did it back in the day. It's, it's like a three-line argument to add them. And then it shows the work of a third grader. And it's got all these weird numbers. And, you, and, and if, you're, if you can't think, you can't figure out what they're doing. And, and the thing is, why are they teaching my kids this way? And what the Common Core is doing is teaching people to think. Now, here's my question for the, here's my question for the panel. Which, which government representatives wrote the standards for the Math Common Core? Which, I mean, was it senators? Was it a, was it a, was it a, a what do you call those, uh, people that go up, lobbyists? Who wrote the Math Common Core standards? High school teachers around the country? Okay, false. So the 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 math the, the, the common core standards were written. There was prior to the common core standards, there was a group of mathematicians at the University of Arizona, as well as the University of Georgia, Yale, and Harvard. They were PhD math educators, they were research math educators that were interested in mathematics and, and, and the structure of mathematics, how the brain works. How does a person, a young person, my daughter's six years old, I'm watching her process. I'm trying to stay out of her life. These were mathematicians <laughs> that cared about math education, not just the structure of mathematics, the way I think about it and the way they think about it, but how education research has shown to teach mathematics. And you can, it, what I highly recommend you do is Google math progressions. These people started this document way before the Common Core Standards were even thought about. When the Common Core Standards came out, the smart people up in Washington, which I'm a libertarian, so I, I usually don't say that, <laughs> the Common Core Standards for mathematics were written by very high-level mathematicians. I highly recommend you read the document from kindergarten. Hopefully everybody can understand that math standards and work your way up to 12th grade. It's a beautiful document. It encourages thinking. I've been working with teachers at Waccamaw Elementary. They're, they're awesome. 
They, 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 their kids are having fun, they're learning, and I can't wait to see where those kids are in five, six, seven, ten years. I agree, there's issues with the assessment, but, and then my last, this is a challenge, if you can read the Common Core Standards for Mathematics, find something that's incorrect or fuzzy or something that you think is inconsistent with the axioms of mathematics, come see me and if you win, I will buy you lunch. Dr. Salaz and I had a conversation prior to the forum and he said, no, I'm not gonna ask any questions, I'm not gonna say anything. <laughs> so I think I won lunch. <laughs> I think we have a question way back there, Amy. A couple of questions, way in the back. Oh, we have them back here too. Oh, I'm sorry. I've had okay. this young lady. Okay, Lauren, go ahead, and then Amy. All right, okay, hi y'all. My name's Alec Cohen, I'm a student here in the education program, so. That's my dean, and I really like him, so thank you for doing all this. This means um, she's about to say something very, very... <laughs> Maybe. Okay, so my question is to Dr. Oren Smith. Um, in regards, kind of, you kind of mentioned the way the Board of Education works, and I read your recommendations about core curriculum and trying to move away from the State Board and move it back to what you call more like the democratic process. And the way that was described reminded me very much of how decisions are made in higher education and that they are appointed. And that was your recommendation that the decision to, from what I understand, that the decision of core curriculum would be made by those appointed. And recently, I'm not sure how many of y'all know, uh, College of Charleston and USC Upstate faced budget cuts for providing books that were disagreed with through, from uh, state legislators. And Dr. Orrin Smith, I thought it was kind of ironic you put that slide about comparing books to pornography because you did compare those books at College of Charleston and USC to pornography. And uh, they faced those reprimands. And I was wondering what you would say to students like myself who believe that system of decision making is too top heavy and how you take into consideration criticisms like that and as well as the hundreds of students and faculty protesting at College of Charleston and USC Upstate and thinking that that would be a good system for decision making in K through 12. Thank you. Wow, what a, what a question. Um, I, I think the, the core of, of the argument, as to use the word core, uh, is, uh, is um, we're just not, we don't have a democratically chosen uh, education governance in the state and they're you know the, the council of state legislatures and the council of chief school officers I think and others have done analysis to show the different ways that it could be improved and there's a myriad of ways of governing education some are appointed by the governor some are elected by the legislature some state superintendents of education are appointed by the governor here we elect them we have a long ballot here we elect the we elect the general of the National Guard in South Carolina. Um, I, I think what I'm saying is we just need a little bit more accountability, a lot more accountability. Uh, we have these two, two groups. They're appointed in convoluted ways. Uh, they often conflict with one another. Uh, and then the House and the Senate have separate education committees, of course. They never can seem to get along. Then we have the governor, and then we have a separately elected commissioner of higher education. So we have five or six entities that never can get on the same page. Uh, at least we've got to simplify that. One way would be the strong governor approach, and that would be that the governor would appoint the superintendent of education and all the members of the board of education. Then you get rid of the EOC. You have one board appointed, all of them appointed by the governor, and they're fully empowered to, to run, the, um, run the school districts. Uh, from, the, from the state level, that is. Um, that would be a very powerful governor. South Carolina is usually not very comfortable with a very powerful governor. So traditionally, we're a state legislative state, so how do, you get, how do you get around that? One way, elect one member of the State Board of Education from each congressional district. And only the legislators that uh, represent that district can vote for those people. Uh, another would be to elect members of the State Board of Education on the ballot. Uh, every voter would get a shot at electing a State Board of Education member. I'm basically saying there are a lot of ways to govern education. Uh, ours is the worst. We've, we've got to come up with a better way, more accountability, 
uh, more know who is, who's in charge and not having multiple chiefs. Uh, no, no other state does it this way. Florida sure, surely no. didn't do it this way. <laughs> I'd just like to yeah, follow up with that. I agree. We do, we do not have an accountable uh, system. So, I mean, the way Common Core was adopted, you have to have the EOC and the state board adopt them. And whenever they decided, or before they decided to adopt Common Core, they actually, it looks like they didn't follow the law to include parents. State law actually says they have to have a task force whenever you're switching standards to include parents. They, quote, modified their procedures to accommodate the Common Core timeline. So. Um, parents weren't really involved in, at least in the process in South Carolina, it appears, at least from what, what they said. So, and what, what are parents going to do about it? I mean, like we said, they, they're, it's a hybrid board between the EOC and the state board. So, primarily it should be in one branch or the other, executive or the legislature, so they can actually be held accountable for, to voters. And if you think that's surprising, you ought to be an educator that gets two report cards that don't look alike. <laughs> I would like to clarify one thing, that uh, school systems are governed by local boards of education. They're not governed by the state, uh, although we do have regulations and guidelines with which we have to comply.